Good morning, everyone. How are you all this morning? I'm Carla. I'm the marketing manager here at Fuse Forward. So um, I'd just like to welcome you to this remote control. It's the eighth one in our series, um, which is exciting. Today, it is um, the topic is the future of EAM. So the top five trends in enterprise asset management. And our CTO, Mark, who's on the call, will be um, walking us through the, the next wave of advancements. So I'm looking forward to getting this session started. I won't keep you any longer. Um, let, over to you, Mark. All right, well, uh, give you a little background first off. Uh, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. I've been doing remote control sessions recently on virtual operations management for utility companies, uh, dealing with things like digital twins. But I started out my career working in the oil and gas sector and in the utility space, working on enterprise asset management systems. So I've done a lot over the years and trying to understand what's out there as I shared with the marketing team. The content in here is like, wow, I remember all of this. And this is where we came from with a lot of, of smaller systems over the years. And now where are we gonna go to? So I love going through envisioning the future, looking at what the technologies are and then how we can apply that technology into the energy infrastructure and utility space. So that's what I'd like to do. And that's what I'm gonna share with you today. So as we get through this, a couple of little questions that we, uh, that we wouldn't mind uh, asking. We always like to start off with a little bit of a poll. Um, Edric will start off with this and say, for the EAM technologies, what are you currently using today? Are you using one of the big work order management systems like a Maximo and Oracle and SAP or using something uh, other um, such as a, a small CMMS on the, on the web? What are you using today? If you wouldn't mind answering that, that would be great. Gives me a little understanding of what people are at and what they're, uh, where they are in this uh, and what the audience looks like. Yeah, just give this a, a little bit longer here. Um, it looks like votes are coming in. Really mixed, um, really mixed results. So it looks like, um, all right, I'm going to end the poll here, but it looks like we have a really um, even distribution between Maximo, Oracle, SAP, um, a big portion, 38% are saying other or don't know. And there's also another group, about 31% of us that are not using an EAM. So we've got basically about a third, a third, a third. A third is using small stuff. Um, a, a fair number are using the big enterprise products. So I would look at that and say that's about 25% and then basically don't know or other 38 and not using an EAM 31, which means you're here to learn more about the other stuff other than EAM which hopefully we'll be able to share with you today. All right, so moving forward, let's go through and, and talk a little bit about where we came from. Um, what is EAM? EAM is Enterprise Asset Management. Used to be called Computerized Maintenance Management Systems and coupled with, in some cases, uh, things like project management software that is used to manage the design construction, CMMS software, which is used for maintenance and operations, and then basically EAM has been that portfolio of applications that kind of have come together to manage all the different pieces today. So what we have in the way of the EAM is the centralized asset management. What we kind of have, and, and this was the projects that we've done over the last 25 years, going through and setting and say, can we go and inventory our assets? Can we at least track the work that we're doing so that we can actually get in and track what we're doing with respect to reactive maintenance and being able to get into at least moving forward with predictive or preventative maintenance programs, taking our pumps, going through and doing regular oil changes on them, managing our fleets, making sure that we're going through and, and doing our regular checks, grabbing all of the usage information for fuel, going through and monitoring the water systems and being able to go through and do our, re our regular cleaning cycles in the mainline systems and, and in our sewer systems. So we have our regular cleaning cycles in place, going through and doing our hydrant exercising programs. Those are all the things that a centralized asset management system basically was doing or in is currently doing today. Um, there is a question here. Are you referring to also Oracle WAM, work order, work and asset management? Yes, we are. So those are what those systems do. Now, typically when we look at an EAM and where we started doing this, it was typically been set up to be on premise. It links in and hopefully it's starting to share data with things like the supervisory control systems. 
but a lot of them have been siloed, segregated apart, and that's where we are. And we started to get it in where we wanted to link it in also with our customer billing systems and our service management so that if a customer calls and says, I got a problem with my sanitary system, like I had recently at my house, I needed to call in and have the guys come in and do a sewer clean out. So those are kind of the, your customer calls and then it links into billing where they're gonna bill us for the clean out process if they have to do that. That's the state of the nation today, or at least that's what I would consider to be the base infrastructure that's probably in place in, in probably 60 to 70% of utilities and city operations and, and the, uh, the property management firms out there today. Key thing that's kind of come along over the last 10 to 15 years as well, has been how do we inventory it? And, and we look at things like um, the uh, ISO 55,000 standards, which are all related to doing asset management and standardizing the inventories and being able to look at what the best way is to depreciate and amortize asset investments so that we can actually start putting together that new investment program to maintain and rehabilitate all the aging infrastructure that we're looking at today. Well, that's kind of the base. That's where we're starting from. Now, that is currently where certain people are going through the journey and trying to go through and put all those different pieces together. But what I like to look at is where are we going? What, what is it that, that we're really looking at? And all this new technology we hear about coming out all the time. Uh, we have things like IoT. Well, what is IoT? Internet of Things. Things like sensors out in the field. Uh, I've got one utility organization that's putting vibration sensors in all their pumps. Why? A vibration on a pump is a way to determine whether it's actually operating correctly. And when we start looking at the vibration analysis, we can start determining whether there's cavitations in the actual cylinders and understand whether there's going to be showing a potential failure in the pump. So we use vibration to help us do that. That's where IoT comes in. But this, before IoT, one of the things that we always looked at um, is wor mobile workforce management, which is what was going on with mobile workforce management. And we started looking and people are currently going through and using technology out in the field to go through and do that, um, to go through and be able to dispatch and manage specific work orders and do dispatching. But really the future of EAM is related to the next three, predictive analytics, real-time streaming analytics and augmented reality. We're gonna be looking at things like, and this is what I wanna go through, is each one of these different environments of mobile all the way through to augmented reality and look at what those trends are in each one of those areas. Things like streaming predictions, looking at autonomous control systems. How are we gonna be going through and changing the way that we look at enterprise asset management and the different technologies are gonna change the way that we operate our, our cities, operate our campus environments, operate our building portfolios. What are the different tools and technologies that are gonna be coming available or that are available today to help us do that? So let's talk about it. I'm gonna start on the first step of the journey here, which is mobile workforce management. So what is, what is mobile workforce management? How is it changing? So mobile field force is changing. So what we have today is everybody's got a smartphone. And we used to get in very ruggedized, hardened devices. And, and that was kind of one of the key things. And they were very expensive. We're talking three to $5,000 for a handheld device to go through and monitor work orders in the field, dispatch field crews, collect work order data, and all of that. Well, with the decrease in, in the improvement and the decrease in price of these devices, we now have pervasiveness of mobile technology. But not only that, with the iPad, with uh, the Samsung Note, we now have a capability where we can basically do drawings in the field at a very low cost basis, where in some cases, these are deemed to be throwaways over a year to two years, where it's two to $300 for a device to put in the hands of a field worker. So what happens here? Well, that now allows us to go through and increase the pervasiveness of mobile computing, and we start having 5G networks out there. With 5G networks coming online over the next 12 to 24 months, we now have the ability to go through and do streaming graphs and, and models and do 3D simulations on a handheld device with all that capacity and that network linkage that we have. Some of the other trends coming along, well, we've got these things where we've got contractors. I've got one organization we've worked with, 80% of their field crews are subcontractors. 
but they do centralize dispatch. So the mobility is a key piece because these independent contractors are the ones going doing uh, safety inspections, field installs, and they need to be receiving a work order on a handheld device. The other things we start looking at is new demand models. Uh, we've got customer demands. Can you go through and sign my work order when I'm in the field? Um, extreme weather events requiring new, new responses where I want to be able to go through and put people on the field after a major uh, weather event, uh, like a hurricane uh, recently, and be able to go through and have those emergency workers going through and seeing what's going on with, with real-time mobile situational analysis. All right, so we've got all of that. You know what else we see? Is we see this where not only do we have mobility, but we've got this large distributed asset portfolio. So in cases where we have this, we've got things like, this is an example of where all the fire hydrants are. Every one, two blocks, three blocks, you have a fire hydrant. Well, one of the key things in a water utility is how do I go through and do my fire hydrant exercise program? There's been multiple cases where if they hadn't done it in years, they're being forced under new regulations to make sure they have a regular exercising program. That means that you have to go through an exercise every two years. And if you haven't done it, then how do you go through and get it all done in a very short period of time? How do you optimize the crews to go out there to go and do that? How do you package up the distribution of that? So what we start looking at with mobile workforce is electronic work order management, how we can now use these handheld devices and mobile workforce and do dynamic scheduling to do this. One of the things on one of my recent remote controls, I talked about transport for London in the UK. We run the bicycle hire network, a network there uh, with, one of the, with a couple of other service providers. And one of the key things that, that is required there is moving bikes around dynamically around the city. Well, bicycle networks in the world of COVID are becoming more and more of the, the, the transportation mechanism of choice. So how do we dynamically move around the bikes with dynamic scheduling? And can we use different kinds of transportation methods in order to go through and move the vehicles around to move other forms of transportation around? So there's always a challenge of understanding how the mobile workforce is trending and the kind of things that we need to do to go through and manage that mobile workforce. Major trend number one, mobile workforce management and the pervasiveness of 5G networks and mobile devices like mo smartphones in order to enable all of this mobile workforce. All right, let's move on to trend number two, IoT. So internet of things. Now, this is a buzzword out there. It it's, talks about almost anything. In the, in the sectors, and when we start talking about the industrial or the, the energy sector or the infrastructure sector, IoT has actually been there for years. I, I, I like back to the time that we had smart meters or not even smart meters, dumb meters, that were collecting out in the field the readings on how much water a utility or a consumer is using, and they drive trucks around to go through and get the meter reads, and they were using wireless technology. Well, guess what? That's been there about 20 years. We used to have little mobile devices, or we used to have somebody going around with a with a paper clip or a um, <clears throat> pad of paper and going and writing down. Here are the readings from all these different clients, and this is what I'm going to bill them this month. And they went through and did a did an estimate every couple of months, and then once a quarter or once a year, they would go and do a physical read, and then they would tally and say, "Okay, now I'm going to give you an adjusted bill." IoT is changing the game. Internet of Things is all about sensors. It's, it's about new kinds of sensoring technologies. It's got a whole bunch of different things that we can start collecting. We started in the utility space with smart meters. Now we're moving into submetering. We're now moving into sensoring that attached to submetering systems. So what is all that doing for us? Well, it's creating this massive amounts of rich data sets. Um, we did a number of projects where we were collecting sensor data or smart metering data and said, can we use the smart, meet, smart meter data to go through and help us go and actually look for water leaks without actually going through and digging up the ground? Well, we can. We can use the billing, rec the billing records and the billing meters in order to help us go through and collect additional information that we can use for other purposes like preventative maintenance for leak detection. So when we look at IoT, we basically have these new types of sensors that are coming in. Um, by the way, that is the air conditioning system we just installed in our office. It's a regionalized, very narrow sensor. It can also be used for things like uh, monitoring uh, flow rates of air. We look at other kinds of things where IoT can help us go through and do remote operations. 
So when we start looking at it, we had a whole webinar, a whole webinar on this one topic alone. We can use IoT and remote uh, robotics to go through and manage a utility or manage a plant operation remotely. So those are some of the things that we can do with it. But how does it apply to an EAM system? What does all this mean for, for enterprise asset management? Well, as we start getting into things like IoT and sensors and the data feeds, what can we do with all of this data? What can we do with more sensors in the field? What can we do with remote control devices using Internet of Things? Well, we can basically create device accountability. That means that with an IoT device, we can put every single vehicle and they've got a GPS signal. That basically means for EAM, we now can use that low cost device attached to our mobile networks and start using it for monitoring what's going on out in the field. Not only that, but device accountability for enterprise asset management, I like this, this case study, is healthcare. So we, we basically know that inside a hospital, we have to track everything. But not only that, but in surgeries, they need to do things like monitor all of the different things that a surgeon uses when you're under the knife. Where's the knife? Where's all the sponges? Where are all those things? And we can Bluetooth enable those, put little tiny sensors on them, and that allows us to go through and monitor where everything is with basically different near field communication technologies. So it allows us to do device accountability. Well, you can get it down to the knife that's used to cut your skin, or you can take it into a mobile generating genera generator that's put on the back of a truck in a utility operation. And we can monitor where that thing is and how, how far it's going, even down to the broom. Can we put a sensor on a broom? Sure we can. And it can be Bluetooth enabled and we monitor where it is. All right, what else can we use all the IoT devices for? Well, as we're generating all this data sets and all of this data, we can start doing it for equipment failure. So we start getting into predictive maintenance and we wanna, the, the holy grail is to being able to go through and look at all my assets, understand their performance curves, be able to not have to do, call it preventative maintenance on an engineered cycle, but get into predictive maintenance where instead of going through and changing your oil every six months, if you're using a synthetic oil, I can change it when there is a certain viscosity rating changing in my oil. And that basically helps us to go through and manage equipment failure. We can get longer periods between our maintenance cycles without going through. We can start using that censoring data to start doing a predictive maintenance program and stop equipment failures. Like I used on the other area of the vibration sensors, we put vibration sensors, we can use those to also predict performance of those actual pieces of equipment. All right, what else can we use it for? In the AAM world, we always have the area where we have field crews out there. And in the world of COVID and everything else, what we want to do is we want to understand where people are and are they staying far enough apart? Or did they come in contact with other people for tracking purposes? So this is a health and safety issue. We have workers' compensation uh, insurance programs all in place that need to manage field safety, and they want to make sure that they're, they're managing contact points between people. But at the same time, we also want to be using IoT devices to create fields. So we can basically put devices around a field, five different ones, monitor who's going in with those geofencing of those environments. IoT allows us to do that and allows us now with part of our EAM systems to create work orders with those safety plans and that technology enabled as part of the execution of the work order in the field. All right, that's trend number two. Let's move on to trend number three, predictive analytics. So I've already shared a little bit about this. Predictive analytics is kind of, well, it's my passion actually. It, it's the, the whole area of being able to collect data but not just the, the log data, not just the readings, but now what can we do with all of those data sets? What are all the things that are coming along? So let's look at some of the technology, some of the trends right now. So one part is we've got this buildup. We, we've talked about the world of EAM in the, few, in the past. We've added mobility to it. We've added IoT sensoring to it. All right, now what happens is you start creating those building blocks. We start getting more and more data so the growth of the data resources is coming in. What else? Well, not only that, but I, I mean, I talked about this back in 2001, 2002, is the aging infrastructure. Talked about it then, guess what? 
20 years later, 15, 18 years later, it's still aging. And have we done all of our preventative and predictive maintenance programs? Have we done a massive rehabilitation of the infrastructure? Nope. So it had about 20 to 30 years of life back then. And now we're running down and it's got 10, 15, maybe 20. It, it's starting to go through and we've got this massive portfolio of aging infrastructure, bridges, roads, potholes in the roads, uh, pump stations, uh, transmission grids, all of that stuff is aging. And there's a whole challenge that we have of trying to go through and predict when it's going to fail, what we need to do, how to optimize the program to go and do rehabilitation. Not only that, but new regulations are coming down. Um, we have climate change. We have these major, major weather events, fires in California. We have hurricanes coming up from, from the uh, Gulf of Mexico and through the, uh, on the Atlantic. We're seeing more and more major events in the, uh, in the Pacific right now that are starting to attack and hit us in the North American market. We're starting to see the temperatures rise significantly. So how does that gonna affect us? What we really wanna understand is predicting weather events. We wanna be able to overlay the prediction of the weather events on our infrastructure. We want to be able to look at things like the predictions of all of these data feeds and understand whether our populations are using increasing their services or are they decreasing their use of our, our valuable resources. All of that within a world of shrinking budgets. So if you start looking at these two balancing, it's, it's a complicated balancing act of trying to understand how much money I have available, which is decreasing, looking at all these externalities, climate change, forest fires, and all the impacts that they're driving, looking at our portfolio of assets and how do we manage it all, and then looking at all these data coming in that we can now look and say, all right, if I overlay all these data feeds on top of it, how do I start optimizing? So the key thing that we start looking at is that's where predictive analytics comes into play. So how does it apply to enterprise asset management? Well, if we now have all of this data coming in, we now have all of these different pieces coming along, we can start looking at field crew scheduling. Instead of going through and just scheduling it nightly, we have dynamic scheduling mechanisms. We can optimize the travel patterns of the crews within certain areas and overlay current transportation and current traffic flows within the area to optimize the, the run times and the travel times between sites so that our field crews are working in certain regions on certain days and, and be basically being able to get from job site to job site in 10 minutes instead of having to drone travel an hour in high traffic zones during the regular workday. So there's a whole area of being able to go and look at that. Also being able to go through and predict what's gonna happen in the next two days and be able to decide, should we really be going through and doing our hydrant flushing program or our mainline flushing program during a massive uh, downpour of rain? Let's try and schedule some of our work when we see certain weather patterns happening so we can basically drive it at the same time. So it all comes into field and work scheduling and how we can use all of this different data and predictive analytics to go through and help us to do better crew scheduling. All right, what else? Well, we can also start looking at our reliability or asset reliability. So things like, you know, as I, as I always look at predictive, predictive maintenance programs, I think of, all right, if I've got an asset and it's a high risk asset, a pump in a pump station that's pumping fresh water um, to a house is more important than a pump that's delivering water to a fire or to a, um, a fountain. So it might be the same pump, but if I wanna look at the reliability, I, I need to create criticality of my assets. Then I wanna go through and look at the reliability and the risk of failure. And I can start using that metric and that method of identifying, classifying and ranking all of my different assets. And I can use predictive analytics to basically put in a, a more preventative program on certain asset groups and more of a reactive maintenance program on other asset groups. But that requires a very complicated predictive analytics engine. So we do that today. We, we basically have these optimization services available to go through and do that. And so these techniques and these methods are all in place right now to go through and create an asset reliability program. All right, what about system performance? So I look at portfolios of assets and a simple asset group is easier to, is easier to define a maintenance program on, but what about a system? What about a system which is like a complete water distribution network? What about a massive that's overlaid with a water collection system? 
that has overlaid on top of it its energy consumption patterns and how much energy is being used to do the lifting in the in the waste systems and the pumping on the water systems. Okay, so there's an integrated system now of a performance of looking at the cost of power to go and do all of the running of these pump stations and lift stations. There is a, a flow pattern of how much what demand we're getting in the way of how many people are flushing the toilet tomorrow, how many people are going to be going through and turning on their showers in the morning, so we can look at the demand profiles. Now that's the overall system model. And should we be using different ways of going through and bringing our different commodities in different areas for the high demand periods and being able to go through and do localized power gen, as an example, inside a pump station so that we can basically be driving that at the same time. That is overall system performance. Those are things of the future where we start looking not in silo at one area and one portion of it, but we always look at this concept of an integrated intelligent city. And a city has transportation networks, water systems, wastewater systems, building portfolios, park networks, people moving around, vehicles moving around, transportation grids moving around, and electricity being used to go through and move all of that. How do those systems interact? Well, in an enterprise asset management, we're the main collectors. The EAM in a city scale environment is the primary repository of all the assets. The GIS system is the mechanism that is overlaid on top of that to basically go through and model and show where they're all located. When we start looking at predictive analytics, we then start looking and say, now, can I start taking all the reading data I'm getting from my sensors, from my meters and, and my SCADA systems? And can I start now looking at the overall systems and how they're performing relative to each other? That's the future that we start seeing with enterprise asset management and the use of predictive analytics for enterprise asset management. And I'm now related to trend number four. Trend number four is the real-time analytics world. So while we talk about doing this stuff, when we start thinking about modeling, our engineers in the past have done a lot where they've done one-off models and they do this as part of a planning program on an annual or semi-annual basis. Or we start looking at urban planners that are looking at this over a 5, 10, 15, or 30 year horizon to start looking at what the capital budgets need to look like. But that's great from a planning horizon, but really, you know, as an operator, operators care about the here and now. What's going on today? What's going on in this minute? Are we having inside our environments new ways of being able to monitor? things like the real streams of the water and being able to find virus infections inside our water streams, inside our wastewater streams that are going out so that we can start looking at what's going on right now inside my service areas if I'm a utility or inside my building portfolios if I'm a building manager or inside my hospital if I'm running a hospital and I'm looking at what's going on with my, safe, with my, with my uh, healthcare workers. So let's look at this, what, what does this mean? So to me, real-time analytics is all about the pervasive use of remote sensing technologies. So it's building upon that trend number two, which was the IoT enablement. So I have on my wrist here, I have my Fitbit. You know what I do every day is I actually monitor my heartbeat. I monitor my sleeping patterns. And the joke of course in the office is, uh, how did Mark sleep last night? Is he in a grumpy mood today because he got three hours sleep because his kids were up? Or did he get eight hours sleep and he's in a really happy mood? And that's what my Fitbit does for me. So it's kind of like one of those little uh, sensors that everybody can be looking at and say, okay, now what is that? Well, I'm gonna to get to augmented reality as the last one. But a little bit about real-time analytics is it's actually with our new, with the new Apple Watch, they're being able to also look at your heart rates and not only that, but be able to go through and determine if you've got palpitations in the heart. Well, that's, that's a sensor. That's what's inside the Fitbit. That's what's inside the Apple Watch but that's also something that can be used and applied to new suits that safety workers have to be using. So we, we've got all these sensors that can be attached to a person. Not only that, we have sensors that can be attached to a vehicle. Not only that, but we have sensors that can be attached to a physical piece of equipment out in the field. And as we start doing that, where we start bringing in those readings, readings are only as good as being able to correlate those readings into an event. So what's an event? Event is the water, look at this, water flow going through this and it's increasing and the speed of the flow in a main line is increasing exponentially. Guess what? That's a real-time analytics calculation to determine a water leak. 
Okay, if it blows up and a valve burst, or if a leak in the, if it's a slow leak in a crack in a pipe, and eventually it goes along, that means the crack has burst and it's now going into the ground. So real-time analytics is the method where we start having censoring technologies out in the field or on the person that we can use for different pieces. And we can now take with all this compute capacity that we have available to us today, we can calculate event records and calculate flow rates in real time and be able to correlate the flow rates to what happened last week, a week, two weeks ago, last year at this point in time. And we can dynamically be able to monitor and help us have a system, a recommender system helping us to understand what's going on. Well, how does this apply to EAM? Well, as we now have that enterprise asset management system, we now want to go and use it as the foundation for doing more and more operational intelligence. Okay, so things like real time water quality analysis. So with this, our EAM system is no longer just about collecting the work order data in the field. It needs to also collect the data from the SCADA system, supervisory control systems. It needs to collect the data coming in from say spectrometers that we put in our real-time water streams. That allows us to, instead of going through and doing sampling methods with 72 hour turnaround to go and find out if there's a contamination in our water flow, we can do it in real time. It can be an early detection system for a water contamination in a, in a water system. It can be real-time tracking of assets. So what we have, we can go through and start looking at other mechanisms and other ways of actually putting different, different components of it. And we can start saying, well, why did the brooms disappear? Uh, where is that generator um, that was in the back of the truck? It, when we have a water leak, where is the best water crew available right now that can go and fix that water leak. So that's where we start being able to use all of these new ways of real-time analytics to look at real-time asset tracking. Um, what about resource allocation? Well, we've already seen with the likes of Uber, um, the likes of Lyft, the mechanisms that they're doing where they're doing real-time linkages of a demand of somebody that wants a ride with somebody that wants to go through and be able to go through and get that right, matching of supply and demand in real time. But not only that, their analytics that they're actually doing is actually calculating the bill during the ride and billing it directly to the customer's account. But we can also be doing that where we have a massive portfolio of bicycles and we wanna do real time allocations of those bikes to the different areas of the city where the trains are coming in and we know what the, the patterns of usage are and we wanna dynamically be able to move transportation vehicles and different forms of mechanisms in our transportation networks to the right places to match supply and demand. So it's not just cars, it's not just drivers, it's bicycles, it's all of the different methods that we have and then overlaying the transportation patterns on top of that to look at real-time resource allocation. So, is EAM part of this? Well, EAM provides the foundation. It's the preventative maintenance cycles that are being used to go through and manage the vehicles to make sure they're ready for the demand profiles that are going to be coming up in the next one, two, or three minutes, or the next couple of hours. I remember a project in the past we were working on with uh, the port, the, one of the uh, port authorities. When a, when a big vessel comes into port, they basically have for every hour that it's at the dock being unloaded, they pay millions of dollars to be at the dock. So the fastest time to get everything off of the container ship, get it onto the dock and get the container ship reloaded and out the door is millions of dollars per hour. So now the question comes in is, all right, so we have all of these fleets, what they call top picks, and these, these, these vehicles are there to go and haul and move all the containers. Well, they don't wanna be maintaining those things during a docking event. They want the whole fleet to be out there moving during a docking event. And they wanna optimize the resources so that when something is going through preventative maintenance, it's being done during the, tran during the transfer time when vessel number one is leaving, vessel number two is coming in. And you have a certain period of time to go through and do the maintenance programs. So when we start looking at this whole area of real-time analytics, it helps us to go through and see if we've got a failure, what can we do to fix that now? And then basically get it all scheduled in for the next one, which is the predictive maintenance, and they start building on each other. 
All right, the exciting part is number five. I said, and I kind of alluded to this, augmented reality. So in augmented reality, what is it? Well, we, we, we basically have, and we've already maybe heard of the thing of, of uh, virtual reality, which is you put on these big glasses and you go into this virtual world and it's a gaming world and you get to go in and some kids go through and play soccer and they're doing it and they're, they're basically moving around. Other ones is they've got the gun games or you're driving a car and it's, 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 it's not augmented, it's virtual reality. But augmented reality is a different way of doing that. It's taking the real world that you're in right now, putting on a similar type of, of apparatus and being able to overlay on top of what you're seeing with your eyes in the real world, other types of information that you're basically being able to look at while you're actually doing work in the field. All right, so what does this look like? So I did a remote control series on digital twins. Um, so if you want to do that one, that one, as Carla said earlier, it has been recorded. We had one on virtual operations. We've had one on digital twin technology. Well, digital twins are creating a virtual world that you can basically create a model of the physical world in the virtual world and be able to simulate things that might be going on or decisions that you want to make. So augmented reality is part of that mechanism. It leverages part of that digital world and that digital twin to help the people out in the field. Well, what else do, do, does augmented reality leverage? Well, machine learning. So if, if I'm going through and I'm looking at all the sensor data and I'm, I'm looking and doing predictions, predictions are using a machine learning mechanism, but a machine learning algorithm is something that as a decision maker is out there in the field doing things, they might want to have somebody or a machine helping them with different optimizations or different approaches that they can be taking for what they see out in the field. And of course, the last one, which is the one that people are, we've got Elon Musk scared about AI, but we've got things like AI, which might be you know, a, a neural network going through and helping us identify a little bit as to how do I go through and create a recommendation? Can I do autonomous control? Uh, NATO's looking at trusting autonomous control systems right now for defense systems. But we have these ways where AI is here, it's neural networks, there's techniques out there to do this today. We've got machine learning techniques that are being used. Um, every time you go on to Amazon shopping and you get recommendations at the bottom, those are all part of machine learning algorithms. And artificial intelligence is one of those things where you put it into your fridge and it's monitoring what's going in and your usage patterns and it does the automatic ordering for you. Well, that's, that's a little bit more of an AI. But how does all this tech and technology now and augmented reality bring this together into different ways of EAM? So enterprise asset management. Well, you notice in that first picture there, it's training. So when you wanna go through and go into a flight simulator, you're going into an augmented reality situation because you're basically in a specific cockpit design of a plane and what you're doing is you're using an augmented reality and some glasses with what you're actually working on with the physical controls to test and drive the simulator. There's an example of being used to train pilots. But if you're also out in the field and you have a pair of augmented reality glasses on, can I also go through and use it to go through and determine and train, say a technician managing a water plant in a remote location so that they know what to be able to go and move in the way of the valves? Do they know what to do in the way of going and doing a water lab inspection or, or a water quality test? So those are things that we can do for the training to actually train technicians, but use the augmented reality to help them see other things from a knowledge base that's showing them as they're basically touching a piece of equipment in a training room, they can learn how to do that. Plus they can use it for simulators. All right, what else? Well, we can use it for remote diagnostics. So I'm a strong believer. I, we, we did an oil and gas project with a, with a large, large company. And one of the things that they had is they had two operation centers. And if you start putting engineers and what we call level three engineers, so these really smart people in the, uh, that have that really deep understanding of how the system works, you don't want to fly them out hundreds and thousands of miles into the middle of nowhere to go and find out what's going on in my pumping station or in my tank farm. But you basically have a whole bunch of people that live on site there or close to it, and they need to be able to go through and troubleshoot problems. But what they want to be able to do is they probably want to put on some glasses um, that have some cameras on them. 
but being able to oversee that so that not only can the person in the field see what's going on, but the person back in the centralized dispatch or the operations center can also be coaching them with what they're seeing. And what they're going to be able to see is in their glass, they're going to be able to see different pieces of control information of what's going on. So that's remote diagnostic, and it helps us to go through and do that. All right, third one, energy simulation. So another area is in enterprise asset management, one of the key things that we've always looked at is EEM systems are not just used by maintenance and operations departments, they're also used as a key repository for engineers to do the design construction and capital planning programs. So one of the key things they look at is if I understand the maintenance programs, I understand all the pieces going on. Well, as an engineer, I wanna go through and use my digital twin, my augmented reality glasses, and I wanna be able to go through and do a simulation of a new form of a building and what's gonna be done. Or I wanna look at and say, how is this, How if I go through and take this bridge and I wanna add a new lane to it, how will it perform? So I wanna be able to go through and visualize the real world and be able to walk in the field when I'm looking at it and seeing and overlaying my design on the one as I'm walking up and down the road and seeing what it's gonna look like. See if the transportation patterns are gonna work properly with what I was thinking in my head and see a digital representation on top of the physical manifestation. All right, you know, I talk about these things and one thing is, is it's always better to go through and get a visual of what's going on. So I got a little bit of a, a, a little bit of an example here. Um, Carla, marketing team's a great team. They find all kinds of things on the web and we just try, we bring all of this together. But let me share this with you. A little bit of an example of a building maintenance and using, um, base, uh, using virtual and augmented reality to go to do it. So this technician's going in, trying to go through and change a leaking pipe It's coming along. How do I go through and do it? Well, there is a HoloLens. Let me turn on some sound. Probably want to hear that instead of me. And if you see a little bit, you got things where you can actually see all of the digital twins and the drawings underneath and say, that's what's going on. Those are the things that are overlaid behind the scenes. And I can now find the tile, find the valves, and find the turn-ons and turn-offs. Now I know where they are. And I don't know about you, but I've been in multiple situations now where I can't necessarily find out what's behind the wall. But if I knew what the drawings were and I was able to do that, I could do that. Now, what about an electrician? So an electrician's going in and they've got a safety problem in here. Can I start looking at where the right pieces are and get instructions via Skype? So are you looking at the right ones? I'm now looking at all of these things and I'm now streaming that data back to the remote technicians. And they're being able to go through and see the same thing I am. And they're able to go through and say, point to the ones that you're seeing. And that's what they're doing by basically saying, plug it into that port there. So there's an example of what's going on in the world today. So last point I wanna leave you with is, well, how do you get started in all of this? And what is the journey that you need to take? So in order to do this, we basically look at it as a four-step program. Most organizations now have a repository of their assets. They have repositories of the work being done in the field. They probably started on the journey by going through and using mobile technology. And they're now probably in the process of bringing in and censoring some things. First step number one, how can you get going? You can augment your EAM system with a data mark. What does that mean? Well, it means bringing the different pieces together, cloudifying your work order system, i.e. make it available so that all these systems can talk to each other and I have a specific place to put all the data into one place. Over time, you can start integrating in and providing a spatial representation of that data as well, so that as you're dynamically doing it, you've got your operational data, your GIS data, and now all of your work order and field data all together into one place. That starts allowing us to get into SCADA and performance analysis. It also starts getting us into improved situational analysis. And then the holy grail, we call it the, the, the golden egg. The golden egg at the end is implementing new advanced analytics capabilities, being able to use augmented reality for that. And part of that is getting a complete cloud EAM solution. Cloud doesn't necessarily mean in a public cloud. It can be a combination of what's on premise and using capabilities of cloud providers. The more you can bring all of that stuff together, all that data together and all those systems together and talking to each other, 
you're going to basically optimize the value of all of that technology investment for your business and your customers. You're going to decrease the cost of delivery. You're going to be able to go through and make sure your asset portfolio is maintaining its value. You're going to go through and make sure that your executive and everybody else is, is, is getting the return on investment that they're looking for, whether you're a corporate utility, whether you're a corporate property manager, or whether you're a, uh, a public entity trying to go through and optimize taxpayers' money. So we've got the last one in here as I start moving forward a little bit of move your EAM to the cloud. Um, fuse forward, we've done this today. We run EAM systems in the cloud today. We currently have pilot projects underway dealing with predictive analytics and streaming analytics. We've talked about that through some of our remote consoles by I, I, I basically say, go and look at those, review those if you like. It shares with you some of our experience. Um, we have different packages for different users, a little bit of a marketing ploy here, and we can provide everything from working with you to help you get value of what you have today, all the way through to going through and, and sharing the responsibility or operating the whole thing for you in a fixed monthly model. Um, email there or a, a, a link for you to go and talk about that. But as we come to the close here, we've got a, a few minutes here left. And what I'd like to do is open it up for any questions from the, uh, from the audience. I... And if you've got some questions, drop them into the chat menu, please. Yeah, great. I have one here, Mark. How can we ensure our EAM system remains secure in the age of IoT? So I believe that's about IoT security. So I, I'm a, I, I've been doing a lot of work around this over the last 10 years. I have one fundamental premise about IoT. Don't let it touch the internet, number one. So use private networks, whether that's a virtual private network with, uh, with VPNs in there or whether it's basically, uh, and make sure that all of your endpoints are also locked down and secure where it's using a privileged user or a proper system administration and proper encryption key management. So you wanna be considering data encryption techniques, private networking infrastructure instead of public infrastructure. Um, and that basically can be VPN, it can be private uh, cellular networks using what we call um, APNs and, and, and access points, private access points. Those are all the world of IoT. So IoT right now, we see a lot of consumer hacks but all of those ones are using the public internet. And we also leave a lot of, the law, a lot of that consumer devices open with standard uh, access protocols. So locking all that down and using commercial grade and putting it all and transiting it and connecting it into private machine networks is the best way to go. And using privileged user credentials, multi-factor authentication, lock down your system administration components and also use proper encryption technology. It was, a, it was a pretty comprehensive question. It uh, was. Answer, and, answer, and what, sorry. We, have a, we, we had a webinar on just that topic alone, I think, as well. Uh, I think there is an article that you um, actually have written up on Energy Central. So I can probably include that in the, in the email that goes out after this. Um, that's actually it for questions right so now. That's it for questions. Hopefully that was good thoughts, for, food for thought for many people in the audience today things that you can consider, things that you might want to share with your, uh, with your business users um, and your customers even. Um, do want to go through and I'll, I'll leave Carla to go through and talk about our upcoming remote control series and things that we are continuing to educate the marketplace on. Thank you for your time. Okay. Oh, am I on mute? No. You are good. I'm good. Great. Okay. So thanks for joining us this morning, everyone. Um, as I mentioned, this remote control is part of a series, so we do these roughly every month. Um, our next one coming up is going to, uh, we'll be advertising it soon. It'll be regarding advanced analytics, um, looking at what we are doing with our partners at Ryerson University. Um, and if you'd like to find out more information, you can subscribe for our updates at the URL that's on the screen. And Edric can share that in the chat for everyone as well. Um, and also, if you want to stay in touch, you know, follow us on LinkedIn. And we're always sharing information about these webinars and other exciting things we're working on there. Um, you can find us on Twitter at, at fuseforward.com. Um, and we're also on Meetup, um, and Edric's posted the link there. So we have a Meetup group we share details of events about as well. Um, and I think that's everything for now. I'll be following up with an email. So you'll have these links, you'll have the slide deck. Um, and if you have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to me or um, a member of the team.
Great. Well, thank you very much. I think I'm going to end this session now. Goodbye.